There are three things that are going on now, the three most important things that are going on to great extremes that have not existed since the 1930 to 45 period. And it's important to know those three things and then to understand them well. Uh, the first is um, what is going on with money and credit when you get to something like a zero interest rate and you need buying power, the government needs buying power, but they can't, they can't tax it. So what we have is the production of a lot of debt that the central bank prints money and buys that debt to spend. And the last time that happened, in the last few years, it happened starting in 2008, interest rates hit zero. They couldn't lower their interest rates. So they had to print a lot of debt and the government went in and bought it. Okay. And we're coming to the end of a debt cycle. Okay. So this is a big thing, like, because where does the money come from and who will get what? The government will now determine that and then they'll print it and it'll devalue money. Okay. And how money flows, a big deal. So that's number one. The second one are wealth and political gaps that are causing great conflicts. Throughout history, there's always been, the main things that everybody's always fought over is uh, money and power, particularly political power. So what we have is a situation when you have a large wealth gap and you have an economic downturn, particularly if you put a, large, a lot of debt having at the same time, you have a fight. I mean, that's been true through history. and. It, it's reflected in the political gap. So the political gap is, um, it's classic political gap. Left, right, capitalist, socialist. Well, how do you distribute it? How do you, how are you gonna deal with that? that? That becomes the other, and how you fight. So that's the second of the two, this wealth political gap that's causing the conflict. And it's coming at a time where we don't have much money because we're, print, we don't have, a good financial position. We're printing and then and putting it out, but with made up money. Meaning what, what happened, like COVID was a, uh, such a good example. Okay, you have COVID and a, a lot of people and companies had falls in their income that were would be ruinous. If, if checks didn't go out, we would have had a revolution. And it's not like the government had real money. It's, it, they didn't have any money. They already owe a lot. They made more debt and then the government and the Federal Reserve printed it and the, you know, the checks went out, which diminishes the value of money and so on and changes things. So then the third thing is the rise of a great power to challenge an existing great power. So the rise of China to challenge the United States. In all history, there are world orders. What that means are, you know, there are the dominant power. You know, it's like in nature almost, you know, the big bull or something. Anyway, there's the dominant power. And then what happens is in 1945, um, the United, we entered the American world order. We, the United States won the war. And then in 1945, well, the, the, the winners of the world carved up the war, world. We had 80% uh, of what was considered money at the time, gold, 80% of the world's money, essentially. We counted for half the world's economy and the rules were set in the United States, basically. That's why the United Nations is in New York, the World Bank and the IMF are in Washington, DC, because we began the American century. And then uh, we are now at a time, we've never had somebody, uh, another power challenge us uh, in the same way. There was the Soviet Union, but they were always a fraction of the size economically, so couldn't compete on that same basis. They had nuclear weapons, but they didn't have the economic power and so on. But now we're dealing with China coming on as a power. I spent a lot of time in China over the last 36 years, by the way, and I admire how they're doing a lot of things. Right. I mean, I know it's controversial to say that, but um, in terms of like, they're a power. Whoa, their average income has increased by 30 times, you know, so they're a comparable power and they're also growing faster. And so that is, it has an effect. So those three things are 
things that never happened in my lifetime before, but happened before in history, which led me to do the studies of, of, of what happened in history and the lessons I could gain. It affects everybody, you know, like we know, let's start with ourselves. Most importantly, forget about the outside thing. Can we be healthy and strong? And what do we need to do? Like to know that you have to be in it together. Like if we can row in the same direction, okay. If, if we can have thoughtful disagreement and get past that, if we can be in it together, like the wealthy and the poor, and, and I know it sounds so difficult, but at the same time, if you read history and you see what happens when it's not, when you have a civil war, like we could be on the brink of a civil war. I'm, I'm, I, that sounds so crazy, but the truth is in most countries, almost every century, there was a civil war or a revolution, some form of civil war or revolution. Um, so it's almost inevitable that we're going to have something. Okay, oh. you either resolve it or you, you you start fighting so badly. Once you cross a certain line, there's no coming back. Okay, because you do the damage, you you you, you demonize, and it, that person, such an enemy, or that class of people is such an enemy that you, that the communication's gone and the fight. Well, you see this in politics today. In other words, is there a respect for the system and a mutual respect of trying to resolve these types of things? Or will they go to any lengths to win? Because a constitution or law will only carry you to so far, okay? There has to be an element of respect for it. Right. If you think about, I, I want to distinguish there's big differences in opportunities. So let's say, supposing you have two people of comparable opportunities, the marshmallow test is you take a kid and you say, OK, uh, you can have one marshmallow now or you could have two marshmallows in 15 minutes if you don't eat the first one. OK, once you start to realize that deferred gratification is going to make you better and so on and you start to count count and you say like something like how many days weeks months or years can i live if i don't have money come in and you start to focus it on that that's the first step Okay, like the marshmallow test. So I want to save. You got to start there. Then if you do that, now you got savings. So the next thing inevitably that's going to come at you is where do I put it? And then you get your choices and then you experience it and you learn. I think first you, you start with one of the most important things. First, calculate how many days, weeks, months, or years, you can live on your saving. Mm -hmm. Because when you do that, you'll start to, you'll gain security. So look at how much you're spending, okay, and then say, how much do I need? And whatever that number is, you're going to need more than that, because it may go down rather than go up. So, okay, now do I have a year spending? I think, I think you, you start there. Then you start to think, uh, what are the things that are most important for me? Like, and then you start with your, your business or your residence that have a symbiotic relationship and that you know well. Let's say it, it, if you'd start with your business, okay, you're closer to that, investing in yourself with, with whatever that may end up being, that may be your best investment. But if you're in a job, and that's not the thing, right? Because you because you're in a different position. You need a certain amount that's liquid. You, in other words, you you got it in your house. You got to make a mortgage payment or something, and all of a sudden you're uh, you know you know it's not liquid, and you lose your job. Well, that can cause you trouble. So how much do I have that's liquid? How much do I have that's not liquid? Okay, and you start to get those things right. Pretty soon, you're you're getting yourself in good shape. Yeah. You do those things. 
you know, you're pretty much in good shape. And then you're also having some experiences and then you go beyond that, you know, okay, what's a stock, what's a bond. And then, you know, you learn through experiences. I, I learned through my, my experiences. I started when I was uh, a kid, 12, I used to caddy and I took my caddying money and I put it in the stock market. And uh, I was lucky. What happened to me, by, by the way, is I took my catting money. I bought the only company that I ever heard of that was selling for less than $5 a share. I was really dumb. I thought um, I'll buy more shares. So if it goes up, I'll make more money. Uh, and it was the only company. It was a company that was about to go broke, but somebody, some other company acquired it and it tripled. And I thought, no, oh, it was an easy game. <laughs> and I like it, easy money. So, but you know, you experiment and you learn. Avoid the following mistake, the most common mistake of investing. Thinking that the investment that did good is a good investment. Quite often, those markets that did really, really well became more, more expensive and the naive money buys the thing that was hot. So here's another one that's really important. Diversify. Because what I learned about this is that, first of all, all investments uh, compete. And it's not easy to t sell, tell whether one investment is better than the other, because if people could do that, life would be easy and everybody would make a ton of money. Um, so, And this is a competitive game that's very difficult to compete in. So it's very difficult to say which one's better or worse. You can take experts and you can and do all sorts of tests and you'll find out that they can pick that and you can't tell whether the worst ones are gonna be better. So because of that, you understand that um, uh, even picking the best ones is difficult. And particularly if you're naive, like we spend hundreds of millions of dollars each year on research to try to give us an edge, wow. okay? Now you've got to compete with us. So uh, competing in the markets is more difficult than competing in the Olympics. But there are more people who try harder in order to do that. So it's a zero sum game. Mm -hmm. So, but diversification will reduce your risk without uh, reducing your return. That's critical.